welcome everyone to today's webinar, Putting Purpose at the Core of Our Business Practices, hosted by the Council for Inclusive Capitalism. My name is Meredith Sumter and I'm the CEO of the Council. And it's wonderful to have you with us today and also to be joined by Charles Wookie, who is a founder of Blueprint for a Better Business and a key contributor to the Blueprint approach in working with companies to realize our purpose and operationalize that purpose for greater value creation for society. So this is what we think of at the council as profit to the broader benefit of people and planet. Um, thank you so much, Charles, for the informative um, pre-reads and the wonderful video clip of Viktor Frankl speaking on finding meaning and purpose in what we do. Um, joining Charles today, I'm delighted to say, is Melanie Dolbeko, who is CEO of Tarani, a family-owned business and a B corporation, which has been around since 1925 and is in my coffee um, every morning. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, and also <laughs> has an organizational purpose of flavor for all, opportunity for all. Thank you for being with us here today, Melanie, as well as Layla Page, who is the head of sustainable banking performance and frameworks at NatWest Group. And this is one of the UK's largest banks. And it has a purpose to champion potential and help people, families, and businesses to thrive. So we've got much to cover in today's webinar. Our guest speakers will draw from their experiences to share their practical perspectives and to guide us in a discussion on the journey of businesses and placing purpose at the core of who we are and of the value that we create. But before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, and this webinar is being recorded and we will be sharing written highlights of today's session along with the recording of only the presentation session of the next hour. So the Q&A and discussion portions that you'll be partaking in will not be made public. Um, also, we invite you to share your questions by using the chat function in Zoom. And we look forward to engaging with your questions during our time together. Lastly, um, at the end of today's event, we will share with you a short survey uh, to get your feedback on the webinar and take any additional questions that you might have. Um, with that, it's my delight to turn over to Charles Wookie. Charles? Meredith, thank you very much indeed. And thank you uh, and the council for, for having us along to um, uh, take part in this conversation. And thank you all for joining. Um, I think the, the way to think about the purpose evolution of business is very much an exploration so the, the the way we've designed this session is conversational uh and it's got a breakout group in the middle uh which i hope you'll enjoy as well as well as a plenary session and after the three of us have spoken so um, the aims of the session really are three to there to introduce blueprints thinking on what being a purpose-led business is and share uh, through melanie and Layla's examples of their lived practice as business leaders what they have been doing to bring purpose to life in their organizations and then in the breakout groups to give a chance for us to share our own experience, our own companies. And we've got some questions for the breakout groups to facilitate that. And then explore together some questions that arise in this real shift in business practice across the world, actually. We're not going to sort it all out in an hour. Uh, and there may well be questions that arise in the course of the conversation that the council might want to pick up at a later time. And so we want to try and distill some of those questions as well. So as we go through in the first part, when you hear from the three of us, if there are questions you've got, please put them in the chat. We'll then have a 10 minute breakout group. We'll then have a 20 minute plenary and we'll pick up questions that, that you've raised in the breakout groups and in the first part of the session afterwards. And also we've already got some questions which a number of you have submitted ahead of the ahead of the call. Um, so I'm gonna just gonna do sort of six or seven minutes now on well, what is a purpose-led business and what's blueprints thinking? I've been running a UK-based charity for the last 10 years, working mostly with large companies on this. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that it's no, there's no simple technocratic process to becoming purpose led. I know in business, we're all action addicted. We all want the five year. What's what's the five point plan that gets me for A to B? And we're used to those reflexes and we love having them because it makes everything simple and clear. The bad news is that I just don't think that works for this. And for two reasons. The first is that it's fundamentally about the quality of human relationships we create in a business internally and externally. And in just the same way that there's no five point plan to getting on better with your partner or your wife or your children or your husband, um, in exactly the same way, there's no five point plan to the higher quality relationships. We know what they look like. We know it's about behavior change, but we, we can't just decide to do it and have a plan to do it in that way. The second reason is because 
of the problems that large companies in particular face today. They're complex adaptive systems working in a very uncertain world. And the challenge of becoming purpose-led is partly about releasing the potential of people to contribute to what the business can actually become. And often, while your direction may be clear, what it actually looks like in practice is not clear. And the real power comes when people are committed and share insights and innovate together in service of something worthwhile. And that, too, doesn't lend itself to a five point plan. But the really important foundational thing is that as leaders, how we behave and enable others to contribute is itself a crucial part of what it means to be purpose led. And um, so that's that's the first thing I'd like to say. I mean, and when we started in some of our work with major companies, I remember talking to one CEO who had a. He said, well, I got our purpose. Are we just going to launch it? That was the beginning of the conversation to which I said, well, why? And he said, well, everybody's getting a purpose these days. Surely we should have one. And I said, well, what difference is it going to make to your business? What exactly? Wh why are you doing this? Um, and he stopped. And often I think the, the usefulness of a charity like Blueprint has been to stop people doing things and then get them to start and think. So, Melanie, if you wouldn't mind putting the first slide up, because I think that that essentially just makes the point that mindset how we think about what businesses exist to do is a really fundamental part of this and if as leaders we want to try and create some kind of intervention in order to explore the potential of our business to being purpose-led the quality of mind and thinking we bring to that is really fundamental and there's a lovely quote uh, there on that slide from uh, the former CEO of Hanover Insurance where he says the success of an intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener so that's the first thing I want to say. Now, if purpose is really about people and well, being purpose led is about people and purpose, the two fundamental thoughts that have driven Blueprint's work are basically these. The first one is about being human. And the dominant view in business over the last 40 years in the Anglo-Saxon world in particular has been what many people call homo economicus. In other words, for the purpose of work, we are best assumed to be atomized individuals motivated by money, status and power. Align incentives, the maths will work. All you need to do is appeal to people's desire for more money and they will behave in a way that enables a company to maximize its profits. Economics 101 is the world that many of us grew up in and is a very, very dominant culture, particularly in the US, also in the UK. What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is it's a very narrow view of people. It's true we're all self-interested, but actually when we started Blueprint, we convened across academia and across society and also drawing on wisdom traditions as well and said, well, what do we know about what it means to be human? And the answer is something else. And that's why we gave you the pre-read of Viktor Frankl. So there's a more realistic view. And in that more realistic view of what it means to be human, three things stand out. The first is the desire we have for meaning, which Viktor Frankl brilliantly put in that book. If you've never read it, I strongly encourage you to read it. Uh, called Man's Search for Meaning, written from his experience in Auschwitz. The second is a desire to belong. Yes, we're individual, but we also are social. And we get this from neuroscience, but it's increasingly true in business. Indeed.com have a data set of 10 million people, and they ask them what is the most important criteria for well-being at work. Often everybody assumes that it's compensation. It isn't. It's belonging. You look up Indeed.com's website, they have this fascinating evidence-based description for that. And it isn't just the pandemic. The pandemic has increased this, but we have a human desire to be part of a team, to be not just me, but it's us doing something worthwhile together. The third is that we have a desire to grow and develop. And that is also intrinsic in human beings, autonomy, mastery through work. And this is a really important shift. So the conceptual framing is to say, well, instead of appealing to the things on the left, they're there, they matter, and we're all malleable. So if everybody's acting out of self-interest, so will we. But other things being equal, we want these other things. And what this Attending to this is so important because what it does is release the latent potential of people to commit to a worth a shared worthwhile endeavor to do something together. If my work delivers meaning for me, if I feel I belong, if I feel I have the opportunity to grow and develop through work, achieve mastery and autonomy, I will commit in a way I would never commit if it was just all about extrinsic motivation. So that's why that's so important. And then the second shift of thinking, that's the people shift. Then there's a business shift. And the business shift of thinking is a similar kind of process moving away from a dominant assumption. What's the dominant assumption here that Milton Friedman told us what it was 40 years ago? The dominant assumption here is the purpose of business is to maximize profits. That's the job. It's a nexus of contracts and transactions. And yes, we need to do other things to have a permission to play. 
today it's meet ESG requirements. But that's enlightened shareholder capitalism. Essentially what that is, is to say we're here to maximize profits subject to a bunch of constraints. And there are big limitations to that view of the world. So the choice that we believe and others believe that becoming a purpose-led business involves is moving to a different paradigm. And it is a paradigm. It's a completely different think way of thinking about the purpose of business and society. And essentially what that says is that the purpose is to create value for society. So the purpose of the business is the answer to the question, why is the better world a better place as a result of you being here and you being successful? And don't just tell me about the money you make. How is, it, how is the world better off in terms of people, in terms of broader prosperity? Secondly, the business sees itself as a social organization where people and relationships matter. They're no longer just instrumental to making money. And thirdly, the business thinks in terms of the quality of relationships that it wants to have. Humans who are belonging, committed, and wants to act fairly and integrate these act, uh, impacts in decision taking. So what happens is that you need these two shifts in mindset for a purpose led business to come to life. And if you let's just go on to the final um, slide. So becoming a purpose led business is these two things. It's a choice and a journey where the relationships matter and business strategies driven by the purpose to focus on outcomes. You can now why are both of these important? Because you can have a good purpose and still have a terrible culture and a toxic culture, in which case you don't release the latent potential in people to come in. The converse of that is that you can have a cuddly culture, but lack business discipline and business performance, in which case you don't get the business benefits of having this kind of human centeredness. If you bring them together, everything that we think of now in terms of business effectiveness, value for money, competitiveness, agility in the market, they're all there. This doesn't take any of those things away, but what it does is it reframes them all in terms of what's the contribution of this business to the better world. And there's a lovely quote there at the bottom you see from a CEO I work with who said, when you get this right, people feel that they are valued members of a winning team on a worthwhile mission. Now, I'll just say one word before handing over to Melanie um, more. Blueprints thinking, and please don't try and read this slide. I'm just putting it up to show you a picture. In Blueprints work, we developed, this took a year to write, this piece of paper. We've got another piece of paper that also took a year to write. We produced two pieces of paper in two years. So we've got very low production rate. But this piece of paper is basically a relationship map. This is what happens if you think in the way I described about people and the way I described about purpose and bring those ideas to life. This is a picture of what a business looks like that really does that. And it thinks about the purpose in the middle and the quality of relationships, which are marked by dialogue and being with and alongside people based on respect for human dignity and not doing things to and for them. And that West Group as one of the banks that, one of the organizations that's used this a lot in its thinking and Layla's going to talk about that. The last thing I'll just say is a word about ESG, which I know we can come back to in the plenary. The way I think of the relationship between purpose and ESG is that a purpose is what drives the car and sets the direction. ESG measures, getting better as they are, but there's some problems with them, are kind of part of the dashboard. They give you external validated information about where you're go how, how you're doing on the journey, but they don't set the direction and they don't drive the car. So you need purpose is completely fundamental. It's not replaced by ESG. And I think it's very helpful to keep those two things in mind because we're talking about two things, both of which matter, but they're not the same thing. OK, well, having said that, I'll hand over to Melania now. And she has this wonderful story about Tarani. So thank you very much. I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Charles. I love the, the term a cuddly culture. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Tarani. We are uh, a nearly 100 year old company. We think of ourselves as a 100 year old startup. So the idea is to keep it fresh and vibrant and moving forward. And we are, uh, it's a third generation of family. I'm not one of the family members. We are not just family owned. We are also now employee owned. So it's a pretty exciting place to be. We think about people being at the center of what we do. And our purpose, uh, as Meredith mentioned at the start, is flavor for all, opportunity for all. And that has a lot of meaning for us. The way we discovered these words for ourselves is by looking at what's already in our DNA. So we looked through our history, we looked at what motivates us personally, and we did a deep dive into our core values. So. Flavor for us is not just what we make, it's also what each of us brings as individuals. 
And opportunity is what we are driven to create as a company. We believe that businesses can and should create more opportunities for people. That means economic opportunity, as well as learning growth and development. And you can see a picture of our team here in, um, in, the, in the lobby of Tarani. So let me share a little bit of information that kind of dovetails with what Charles was sharing as a, a framework. So we think of ourselves as being people-centric and purpose-driven. Uh, using the same example of homo economicus, we can look at it as business economicus. And we know that in traditional business, maximizing profit for shareholders is what we would focus on. Traditional is hierarchical and top down, and it's about managerial control and performance management. So with our purpose of flavor for all, opportunity for all, we wanted it to explore a really different way of doing business that's more people centric. So what we focus on is how to build shared value. And I'm gonna share a model in just a moment that looks at that. But in the essence, we think about how it's not just profit for shareholders, but how we build wealth and economic opportunity across our stakeholders, including especially our own team members. Uh, our way of working rather than hierarchical top down is engagement and collaboration. It's fundamental to our culture and it's the idea of every opinion mattering we, when we moved our facility from, uh, from one side of the San Francisco Bay Area to the other, a 30 mile difference, we knew that that was going to change people's lives. So we looked and did a zip code map to understand what the radius would be for people. And then we engaged every single team member in understanding what would motivate them to be a part of it. What would they want built into the design? It was deep engagement that led to 100% retention when we moved. We look at that in the way we design business processes, high, high engagement and other things. And it gives people more agency in their work. And then we have a very high retention rate and very low turnover as a result, even during the great resignation of the last couple of years. And then finally, we have a different model. Rather than managerial control and performance management, red circle, line through that for us. I don't think anybody's ever loved a performance management or performance appraisal process. So we turned it on our head to give people more agency and we participate in something we call contribution management. So I go through that with the board and every single person in the organization talks about what they're going to contribute uh, and at the same time, how we're going to learn and grow and develop ourselves to be ready uh, for the growth in the future. So let me share a quick model. This is a model that I developed with uh, a, a dear friend from Cranemere, um, Diana Proper de Callejon. We presented this at, at Conscious Capitalism, thinking very differently about our business relationship with the people inside the company. And let me start with communication and engagement. This starts really with contribution management and contribution conversations. It's, it gives the people the agency. Then we look at, in our system, how do we really think differently about compensation? Right now, the typical way is to do purely market-based compensation. Good starting point. When we think about frontline team members and, and the idea of creating more economic opportunity, and across our organization, we look at living wage also as a benchmark, which is a really important thing to do. So in California, living wage, depends on the, the county you're in, is greatly higher than minimum wage. So it's how we consider those kinds of things and robust benefits that really make a difference, especially for frontline team members, but for everyone. We look at how we create shared wealth so for us, that meant creating an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan. We also have a profit sharing plan on top of that and a 401k plan so that people can not just build their income and address the inequalities that might exist in income, but we look at how to build wealth and capacity. What comes along with that for us is building financial literacy. So if you talk with anybody in our company, we have about 300 people, you could talk with them about gross margin. And everybody here knows about gross margin because over time we talk about EBIT, 
and EBITDA. We talk about gross margin and we build financial literacy in our company and our company's financials. Everybody in the company gets a bonus based on how we do. And we build financial literacy around how to manage their own retirement. There's more we can do. This is a journey for us, but we've begun. And then finally, we look at how do we help create stepping stones of opportunity to learning, growth, and development, especially for people who haven't had the same opportunities as the rest of us. And for that, we're building skill blocks for frontline team members that allow them to grow and learn, choose their own direction and career path, and also go at the speed that they would like so that they can earn more by choosing different options and, and learn more. And then we're doing leadership development at all levels. So that leads back to then the communication engagement through contribution about how each of us wants to learn, grow, and develop. So it's an, uh, an internal ecosystem we're creating. We also do things externally around flavor for all, opportunity for all, but I wanted to share our internal practices as a people-centric business. And then I think I should probably turn it over to Layla. Sound right? Um, yep. Thank you, Melanie. Um, and that, that's that been so interesting to hear. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hello, lovely to, to be here with you today. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to reveal my incompetence in the the land of slides because I don't have any and so it's just going to be me talking with you for the next um five or six minutes or so um and so when I when I was talking with Charles and Meredith and Milani um about this session uh Charles's invitation to me was really to to give the practitioners view from inside a big organization um and as Meredith said I'm from NatWest for those of you that don't know NatWest it's a one of the biggest banks in the UK. Um, it serves a full range of customers from individuals to large corporates and institutions, offering um, retail and commercial banking as well as wealth management. And we've got a range of brands, NatWest, you may know Royal Bank of Scotland, you may know Coots um, is the other one that's pretty well known because it's <laughs> it's the King's or was the Queen's Bank, now the King's Bank. Um, and we're mostly UK based, but do have a small US and Asian footprint. And so the journey for NatWest started um, really three years ago uh, when our new CEO, Alison Rose, set out um, a purpose-led strategy. Um, and our purpose is to champion potential and help people, families and businesses to thrive. And the challenge then was, well, for a company that's been around for 300 years and um, with 60,000 employees, how, can, how is that meaningful? Where is the meaning? And, and at the time of launch, we identified three areas which from our understanding of our customer's life cycle, we could feel that we could have the greatest impact. Um, enterprise, financial capability, and then climate, and, and climate because it was the, the existential issue that we're, we're all facing. And now we're three years in and we're starting the evolution of our next strategy cycle. It's been really interesting to reflect and there's definitely tangible changes I can see in what we do and also equally critically in what we don't do. Um, but also, and perhaps more importantly, I see changes in how we do this. Uh, so a real focus on our decision making, on the potential impact um, that a decision will have on all of our stakeholders um, and trying to understand as we look at the next phase of our strategy, what um, our stakeholder needs are um, and how we can sort of respond to them. But there's still a really long way to go. So um, I, I'm definitely not standing here or sitting here in front of you saying we've got the answer because it, it's not true. Um, so as, as I was reflecting on, uh, on key learnings, there's, there's a number of them, really. The first one is it takes a very long time um, and the pace of change will vary. So sometimes you'll feel like you're making great strides. Sometimes it will feel like you've gone backwards. Often that can happen in, in the space of, um, of the same week or within days. And so when we, when we partnered or when we launched our purpose and, and we partnered with Charles and with Blueprint in developing it, um, one of Charles's uh, bits of advice or um, reflections to us was, 
it could be a year for every layer of the organization so allow yourself the time and and certainly we <laughs> we hold that tree and I was I was updating our exco last week we we still reflected on that so very much still in the foot, foothills the the next learning is and to the point that we've already been discussing this is about shifting the mindset of 60,000 people in our case, and, and very much on the basis that organisations don't change, it's the people within them who do. So our fundamental has been, how do we engage colleagues? How can we listen to them? How can we allow them the space to reflect on their own personal purpose and how that might connect to the bank's purpose? Um, and the, the whole ask, don't tell, is, has been a real key pillar of our approach. And, and again, interesting to, to learn from Tarani that that, that listening is, is a really core um, part of their approach. Lots of ways we've done it. You know, we've held big conversations where we've had people sort of coming to reflect on their own personal purpose, how that might connect with the bank. Also to think about where they might have challenges with the bank's purpose. So we're giving the space to air this, um, getting together groups of people um, who could agitate for purpose and uh, nurturing, but also provoking them so that they can develop their own thinking and then allow this to ripple out in, in the organisation. But the essence of this is it's, it's very different to what we might have done four years ago when we probably would have said, look, Here's the answer. Here are a bunch of FAQs, and I just go and implement. We're we're absolutely in there. We don't know the answer. We know we've got a really difficult challenge in terms of how we cultivate um, uh, purpose and how we can champion potential. But we want to work together as an organisation to 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 get to the answer. Um, and as much as culture is important, and it, it absolutely is hard systems and process changes is, is the other thing that that we have focused on so while when we started we were very much focused on hearts and minds and you know, the narrative and role modeling so you know because we we did recognize that each individual needs to understand and be motivated to change individually we also need to focus on um, our processes, whether it's capital allocation or strategy development or performance management, um, and engage with the people who are responsible for those processes so that they can drive the change that's needed in those. Um, and what we've seen is um, we can see a lag in the organization because they're both connected and, and having the, the systems change and the process change will reinforce the softer change because people see the processes evolving. Um, and one of the challenges we've faced is where we've seen people, you know, seeing purpose around them, buying into it, believing in it, but their day to day experience of if it's performance management or if it's capital allocation has been has been different. That's been, you know, that's been quite challenging. And so we've had to work to to manage that <laughs> equally. Charles mentioned um, uh, the um, blueprint principles, and we've used those as a foundation for our decision making. So taking that framework, what we did was develop um, uh, uh, almost design principles for decision making, where we encourage people to work their way around the framework, to stand in the shoes of those stakeholders who are represented by that framework, and to think about the impact of that decision on those stakeholders and then to test it using um, a tool we have called the Yes Check before actually then thinking, how would you articulate the decision to that stakeholder? And how would you be able to explain why that is the best outcome overall um, in the context of the circumstances today? And what we find with, with that, as we ran some, some tests with our, um, our colleagues, is that actually it could change up to, 30% of the initial decisions were, were tweaked once you went through that process. Um, I think that idea of adaptability and change is something that, that has been really, really key for us. Um, we launched our purpose in February 2020, then went into lockdown about um, 10 days later. And so what we had to, what we had to do is sort of take all of our beautiful plans about um, purpose and engagement and, and effectively just rip them up because we had to respond to the fact that for a lot of people at that time 
very understandably, purpose was totally irrelevant. And all they were focused on was, was how to keep going through, through COVID. But what's also been really interesting is how COVID has given the opportunity to see purpose in the work that people are doing day to day. And, and we got a real sort of feedback from colleagues about how tangible it felt to be supporting colleagues um, and customers and communities through COVID. Um, one of my final reflections really has been about the importance of experimenting and testing and failing and trying again. And definitely um, what I find is things that have failed once um, are now possible, uh, even though I might not have thought that at the, at the time, because the context has, has developed and changed because people, um, their maturity and understanding of purpose are very different. So as I, as I mentioned, we're in the middle of a strategy evolution right now. And the conversations that we're having um, and that are happening now about how we can understand our stakeholder needs and where the opportunity is for the bank to help address some of those pain points, they just wouldn't have happened three years ago. So I think that's a, a symptom of the maturity um, of the organisation. And, you know, now I can ask, well, what's our theory of change? What's the impact that we want to have? What outcomes are, are we needing to see to tell us that we're moving in the right direction? If I'd asked that three or four years ago, I think I would have been laughed, literally laughed out of the room. Um, and partnership. Partnership with Blueprint has been critical because they've offered us the real external perspective, the challenge, the support that I think um, Charles had described him as uh, our critical friend, which is, is definitely true. So getting that understanding of how others in different sectors are approaching this has been really useful, which, you know, why events like, like today are so helpful. And also really just continually asking what are the assumptions that you're making um, about the impact on different stakeholders and how do you test those? Um, so you are continually getting that feedback and, and holding yourself to account. So I think, I think my main thing though, and, and just to reinforce the point Charles made is, you know, I absolutely don't have a guide um, to, to how to cultivate purpose. And I wouldn't presume to say we know the answer because you know we, we most definitely don't. I, I think, I, I don't even believe that we're actually, there is a final destination to get to. I think this is a, a sort of constant evolution and a continual journey of mm. experimentation and learning. But I think that's that's why I'm really looking forward to the discussions we're about to have, just to see how we can all learn from each other and, and continue to develop that understanding. Well, thank you so much, uh, Melanie, Leila, and Charles for sharing your time and your expertise. And thanks to all of you for joining today's webinar. I, I go back to where we started on, as we run and be part of our companies and our organizations, this is really all about being human, the desire for meaning, for belonging and to grow and to develop uh, together. And Melanie, I go back to, um, you know, to your uh, last e example shared on rallying together to take on the, the challenges and opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, the way that each of us and each of you as members lead your companies and ground your work and purpose is so important. And I invite you to share your stories with us that inclusive capitalism for others to learn from and know how inspired we are by all of you, our members and the work that you carry forth. If you are not already a member of the council, we also encourage you to join us to share your ideas and the actions that you are taking to advance more inclusive and sustainable business practices. And please visit us at inclusivecapitalism.com to learn more. Uh, we will be sharing the recording of the presentation portion of today's webinar, along with a list of resources and materials referred to uh, by Charles, Melanie, and Leila for your onward learning and use. And as this year winds down, it's been a fast year. I hope you'll join us at the council as we continue our inclusive capitalism learning series next year with more opportunities to engage best practices and learn about the work, the innovative tools, the resources that others are, are using to advance their own um, practice of inclusive capitalism and to join our growing community and external partners. Finally, please don't forget to complete that brief survey using the link in our chat box. We wanna hear from you, your thoughts, about today's event and um, learning resources and needs that you have as we design our programming for 2023. 
uh, with thanks from all of us at the council uh, and, and also thanks again to Charles Wookie, Melanie Dilbeco and Leila Page. You all take care and um, keep working, keep moving and keep us posted in the progress that you're making. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Meredith. Very much. Thanks Thank everyone. You, Meredith.